what I want to talk to you about is uh, our trial, and what I want to show you is how um, we think we're creating, hopefully, collectively, a framework for delivering um, the 25-year environment plan, working with partners over, also delivering um, the potential for a system that could deliver the United Nations Sustainability Goals. So, obviously, I, I assume by now everybody will have heard of the 25-year environment plan and all the United Nations Sustainability Goals, which is this uh, ambition that we have to start to do more planet living. And it sounds very magnanimous to talk about that when we're talking about uh, trials that we're doing in humble Gloucestershire, but we really believe that we've got a framework that is completely transferable everywhere. So in the Upper to Catch Up Partnership, um, we've been leading since 2000 and um, about 2013, I think, Chris, with all partners, around multiple different um, opportunities to demonstrate to DEFRA and policymakers about how we can come together with local communities, farmers, partners, and delivering multiple different <coughs> uh, the challenges and different <coughs> mechanisms that are being designed. So we've led on the payments for ecosystem services, for example, we've got natural flood management projects here, as you know, we've had lots of water quality projects, and Jay's going to update you on the wild project, which is one of the key ones of those, um, that we've been working on for the last, uh, um, last five years, six years. So um, we all use this framework, which is based around um, connecting action at a local level. So uh, we're very passionate about the fact that people that live and work somewhere have the cultural connection and the right to be involved in protecting that local area. And now with the climate change response, that's even more important. But what it also does is enables all the partners to come together who have an interest in that local area to work collaboratively so that we can be efficient, that we can uh, unpick the complexity of governance we've created, and that we can enable communities to take local action. So through the World Project, which Joe will tell you about a bit more later on, that we created a sort of template where communities working with farmers can start to map the local issues that they have into a data set and connecting communities along parishes, sorry, connecting parishes along water bodies so that they can work out how the land management and the water management and the land use can actually help build resilience. And it's directly from the success of the Wild Project um, that our ELM trial has been evolved. We wanted, to, we hoped that the Wild Project research that Chris did in an international context might be good enough um, to try and um, to explain to the policymakers and that this sort of mechanism for resilience planning, working collaboratively at a local level, was actually worth investment for effort. We've got to do it again at the ALMS trial, um, but there's always strength uh, in, in evolving your techniques. So one of the things that we are going to run through reasonably quickly today um, is to show you all the different payment mechanisms that we think might be able to be invested into natural capital recovery. And uh, Pascal is going to talk uh, in more detail about the biodiversity um, net gain uh, layer. But what we're trying to do um, is to uh, go through a system of understanding how we can assess natural capital, which Dan will talk a bit more about, how we can create a framework for ELM on which that natural capital valuation is um, able to attribute different functions, which we'll talk about in more detail, and how we can then start to inspire people once they've known what the uh, opportunity is by analysing that data, which is why we're very grateful for the support of ESRI and Ordnance Survey, which we'll talk about more in a minute. We can then start to create platforms for trading from lots of different sources um, to enable us to be able to create that um, benefit to the natural world, which ultimately will help us economically and become more resilient to climate change. So if you can't read them all, at the moment we, we, we're designing the environmental land management scheme. We're involved in volunteers and social capital, that's the release, re release of people working on the land. Biodiversity net gain and nature recovery networks. Payments for ecosystem services, reverse auctions, natural flood management, carbon offsetting, carbon trading, carbon tax potentially, green finance and agri-tech. And there's all, at the moment, there's so many different initiatives setting up. What we're trying to do is say, can we, can we align them and can we make them all work together in a complementary way? So the starting point, the, the bottom of that stack, is really the data. And thank you so much. I can't, can't thank Kitty enough. She couldn't be here today, but she sent... Uh, her representative, to, who is very kindly giving, and we have the whole resource of Ordnance Survey behind us. We're now a strategic partner, and that's all of us, because we work with all of you, with Ordnance Survey. So we have all of Ordnance Survey to help us to crack this nut. And more than that, we now have Esri as well, helping us to analyse that data, but we'll come on to that a bit more in a minute. So what we need to understand is if we <coughs> verify investments, we're going to maximise all those opportunities. How do we, we maximise technology to be able to help us? And if we can start to analyze that data in a strategic way from lots of different sources, 
We can start to understand whether or not we can make societal choices about what we do with our land and all the different things that we, we know we've got to, to accommodate, like more people, and, and keep areas for food, and keep areas for wildlife, and areas for clean water, and all those things, and, and take our prosperity with us in this challenge for climate change, and, and embrace all those uh, opportunities while uh, being able to cope with human pressures. We'll talk a bit more about that. So our environmental land management scheme is based around um, building learning from what DEF, we're trying to help DEFRA, inform DEFRA, um, to actually how you design a scheme post-Brexit. That is not going to be, as we know, it's an old countryside stewardship scheme, we don't think, um, and, but it actually there is a huge opportunity for us to design payments for public goods and ecosystem services. They've done some work before already on the pioneers. We're involved in some the tests and trials. And it's a very short, sharp and, um, uh, sort of opportunity to help co-design this uh, with, with DEFRA. The pilots, where they want to roll this out, is in 2022, which is not far away now. And that's a critical date because that's when our farmers start to get reduced payments from the basic payment, which could have a huge impact on the whole of our farming industry and our rural economy um, if many of our farmers um, are then become unprofitable because they haven't got a good transition to something that's going to sustain a productive and environmentally sustainable way of farming. Um, and if we lose our farm businesses, then we're all in trouble. Um, what we wanted to do, uh, is to say, at the moment, that DEFRA has come up with a sort of blueprint of what it thinks it wants to do, and our test trials <coughs> and the scheme that we've developed is actually feeding into trying to adapt some of their policy thinking. So at the moment, they've got one scheme that they're talking about, which is a broad and shallow scheme, which is a bit like a current catchment sensitive farming type scheme. One is a landscape scheme, which is about farmers collaborating, ac collaborating across the landscape, um, which is very much like the current facilitation fund and potentially a national scheme that creates big pots of money for things like coastal realignment and planting billions of trees. But I think the ambition that they have is that they, they want to listen, they have got open, uh, open ears at the moment to what we're trying to do. So here in the Upper Thames, um, we're working um, for a, a very, very, we're actually uh, four months into a six months first trial. We were one of the first trials to get going and we've been really pushing hard to try and make sure that we do this at a time when the design within DEFRA is taking place so that it is actually not trying to influence after the horse is bolted. We've got um, 20 phase one farmers over the six months between last September and this March. Uh, some of them are in this room, thank you very much. Um, and there's, uh, there's 30 phase, uh, phase one control farmers. And what we're effectively doing is working um, in association with those farmers. We're wanting to work with five communities and ten partners. Who do we work with? Um, but it doesn't matter which partners, we're all welcome to partner. Um, to actually show the government a system where communities can become resilient by working with farmers and a coordinated partnership um, to be able to take this action that we all need to take and how we can do it. What we want to show is that you need somebody to help you do this. You need a central point by which you can coordinate all this action. And at the moment, there's many of us doing many brilliant things, but actually without coordination, it becomes confusing for communities, confusing for farmers, confusing for everybody about what role they can play. And really often, they can't play it on their own. So what we want to demonstrate is the cost benefit of somebody um, locally joining them up um, who can help. So that effectively, uh, shook out our two main outputs of what we want to achieve. We want to further develop a natural capital mapping tool, so we're trying to build on the best of what we've uh, what we've learned already. And Dan will explain in a minute about how we're, uh, which uh, is new for those who saw this presentation uh, before, um, the, with the Land App, which is a, a, a forward-facing for farmer application based around using showing them how they can manage their land. Um, and a survey methodology for being able to, um, to look at how we can look at the natural capital that farmers have. And then um, we also want to show uh, in the presentation later on about how that data can then be used and it can be um, uh, analysed to be able to create that, uh, an opportunity for future management and how we can pull the data behind it. Um, the other is also about um, demonstrating the, this effectiveness of the local advisor. And this isn't just to create a job for us. It's about what we've learned through these integrated projects, is that what the advisors, and it can come from any organisation, can do if done well, can help align all the opportunity that you have between you to be able to maximise the opportunity for funding and resource to actually implement stuff. So that you, once we've worked out what we want to do, we then need to be able to fund it. 
So, as I say, we work. We want to work with everyone. If everyone's interested in being, in being involved, please do. You will be indirectly in one way or another because you're involved in the Other Thames Catchment Partnership. But we're also linking to other people who are doing trials. I'll be Tim from the Wildlife Trust of Lost Tim, um, Mark at the AOMB, and the Sustainable Food Trust are directly at Elms Trials that we're involved with. But we're also getting involved in many more as we're going forward. So uh, the Dutchy Soils uh, Elms Trial uh, is one that comes to mind at the moment. But what we have to do, which is really essential, is we have to record what we do, not only how, what we're developing, but how we developed it, what were the decision processes that we made, how usable is what we're developing, and what we've learned as we went along. So to give you an example, and I think the gentleman from Gunting Power is here, is a parish councillor, um, is this is an example, is there's a little water body here, um, which is um, the Guiding Power, the, the top of Guiding Power. This is actually uh, outside the windrush, uh, sorry, up to actually in the windrush. But you can see directly that the top end of the community is completely, sort of like, from a, the water point of view, is actually completely implicated by the land management around it. And we want to be able to show that there is a, a benefit in investing in farm, <coughs> farm land so that we can actually work with our fantastic farming community as partners to be able to help develop, develop resilience. And that's not just about water and flooding, that's also about food resilience and all the other things and recovering biodiversity. Um, but we need a platform to do that. So what Dan's going to explain to you in more detail, which is the bit that I hope you'll find more interesting uh, than the, the story that I'm giving you now, which some of you may have seen before, is that we want to start to map this in a way that we can have an opportunity to attribute function to our land management type. And we've been doing this through UK Habitat Mapping. And we can start to get communities and farmers to record data and information, whether that's infrastructure or species or all problems that they have, and be able to use that data for them as an individual community working in parallel and contacts with others um, that might be associated with them to actually access a whole partnership of organisations and individuals to uh, enable them to become more resilient. So the third level is what we've experienced is that lots of people want to take action. We all want to take action. It's, we all sort of think we've seen the challenges that are being presented to us in the media every day. But if we have a structure to the way that we respond, we're able to actually go out and do something meaningful but in that wider context because we're able to take the data uh, of our local area and contextualise that in a regional, national and international context and make an action that is actually delivering something to the wider whole. So we've had literally hundreds of different people coming out enjoying being involved in the restoration. This is a DuPont on Sam, uh, not Sam Phillips, you uh, Nick Phillips' land, uh, which also helps us uh, to manage water, create habitat, um, get the soil structure, produce food more healthily, stop flood, all that sort of stuff. So wonderful. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Dan because I'm going to come back to the other layers in a minute. But all the other layers and everything we've found basically rely on um, the UK habitat mapping as we think it's a really good platform for doing this. And we'd like to share that with you. And if you can pick holes in it, please do. But at the moment, we'd like to present to you what we think is a really good idea. So, here yeah, so as Jenny said, I'm Dan, I'm an assistant advisor at the Farming Wildlife Advisory Group. Myself, Pat and the rest of the team have been developing a way to try and make what Jenny's been talking about uh, fit on paper and the data we need behind that. Um, so as just a bit of background, what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with landowners, let them be able to contribute what's happening on their land, but bring in additionality with the specialist advisors. And to do this, we're using a one-tiered uh, one uh, mapping system called the UK Habitat Mass mapping classification. Um, it's been developed over the last 20 odd years by a group of ecologists, their logos are in the top right of the screen, and they were just frustrated with the number of different mapping systems that covered the United Kingdom. So what they've done is they've incorporated the FET, the Phase 1, the UNIS, the vegetation classification, all into one habitat mapping system that everyone can understand. That means historical data can all be translated into it, but also we can work forward all looking at the same page. And the great thing about this, and I'll come on to that, is because it includes cropland and it includes, includes the urban environment as well, which previously habitat mapping just didn't include at all. Um, and the great thing about it is it's hierarchical. So regardless of your uh, skill set you have, you can work with the same mapping system and you can invite others who may have a more specialised uh, skill set to add on to the mapping system you already have. And the way it works is the United Kingdom is divided into nine basic habitats. Hopefully you're all familiar with most of these. And what you do is you build on that initial code, which is just the first letter of the habitat, so for grassland, just letter G. And by adding characters and numbers hierarchically, 
you then get to get more detail about what's in that habitat or what type of habitat you may have. I'll come on to that in a moment, but just to quickly explain why we're thinking in this way is the fact that each of these habitats, whether it's a grassland, whether it's the urban environment, whether it's cro uh, cropland, they're all providing different public benefit and natural capital. Therefore, the, detail, the more detailed the habitat is, we can assign different ecosystem services, so it's quite pixelated from where you are. So for example, if I'm in a grassland, um, it's providing food, but it's also providing fresh water, air and water quality, cultural heritage, etc. So there's a list of, or an ever-growing list of services that different habitats are providing. And as a flag, we're not going to assign these directly, we're just providing the framework which someone else may be able to attribute the uh, value that each habitat is providing. So as I said, it's hierarchical. So for example, I'm not going to go too much into this, but for a grassland, you may be, may be in different types of grassland, but the UK habitat classification provides you with indexes, which basically gets you to look at the species that are in the habitat. And by looking at the species, you can start working through, up, working up the tree to get more and more detail about what that habitat is. So for example, grassland is the letter G. If you're in a calcareous grassland, so you're surrounded by salad burnet, for example, you know you're in a calcareous grassland. That's the type of habitat we're looking for. And it's the same again for all the different, even the urban environments, we're marking out traditional farm buildings compared to just an average playground. So all of this is incorporated within the habitat map. Within our trial, we're also asking some of our landowners um, to go in a bit more detail, and that's especially with the cropland. This is simply because their current agri-environment schemes, whether it's their countryside stewardship or their uh, HLS or ELA, <coughs> directly links with the habitat mapping as well. So when you're in a cropland and you've got floristically enhanced margins around the outside of your field, that is a habitat which isn't currently being mapped. So UK habitat mapping classification will incorporate that type of habitat as well. So we get to look at connectivity across the landscape. With the additionality, we have something called secondary codes. So once we've got our primary habitat, which I've just described, so that calcareous grass under that arable margin, you can also assign more context to what's happening inside that habitat. And we call these secondary codes just because they're a simply uh, a list of numbers that you can add as many or as little as you like to provide context to that habitat. So this is just a screenshot of some of them. So for example, within a grass and field, you may have scattered trees. But instead of, have, instead, of, instead of having to map each individual tree, you can just give the context of the code 11, which we know there's more than just grassland within that habitat. Same again for management type, for example, we can type, uh, just log what type of grazing is happening, whether there's other attributes that may be improving the ecosystem service that field or that habitat is providing. And from a GIS perspective as well, this is minimum lines of data for maximum amount of context and uh, uh, attribution. And also within our trial, we are looking at uh, linear features around the farm as well. So we're not just looking at a habitat as a field, we're looking at the hedges and the dry stone walls and the ditches that you get using the exact same mechanism. And as you can see, for example, we are defining between wet and dry ditches, depending on when we survey, because they're going to have different uh, natural capital uh, values to them. But they're, they're the same linear feature apart from they've got a different secondary code, so they've got a different context to what's happening within that habitat. And what you get, once you've finished your mapping, is you get a nice, clean, crisp map, but also with a lot of detail in it. So for example, this is just a screenshot I've taken. You've got the main G4, so the modified grassland, but also the list of secondary codes that are attached to that habitat gives a lot more detail about what's actually happening within that environment, rather than just knowing it's modified grassland. So for example, the number 137 means it's got some historic aspect with bridge and furrow. Um, and there's a list of a thousand one of these. Within our trial, we're working on trying to build up a better picture that may represent the countryside a bit better, because they are missing some things, but it's all part of the learning process. And what you get is an ever-growing UK habitat map. Um, at the moment, you see it's quite patchy, and this is just a screenshot from some of the chats at the backs, farms. Um, by the aspiration is we will eventually have a very high resolution UK habitat map for the whole of Gloucestershire. I know Juliet might touch on it later, but they've done the top-down approach where they've actually, amazingly, and I don't know how much time it took you, Juliet, but you've managed to scan the whole of Gloucestershire and using land cover maps, they've actually managed to create a UK habitat map, but from a lower resolution. So what we've got now is a push and a pull system where we can increase the resolution if someone's walked around a field, but if there's some no man's land that no one's been, we still know what's there, so we can have a better coverage about what's happening. And yet what it does, it just allows us to make better, more informed decisions. Um, what I'm going to quickly do is, I know I, this is the first time I've gone through this, just to try and get a picture, a better picture in everyone's head, a quick summary of the data we're collecting and why we're, collect, why we're collecting it. Um, so firstly, uh, 
We're partnering up with the Land App, which is an ordnance survey funded startup, which is free to use and anyone in this room can get an account and they can start playing with an interactive map. If you own a farm or you've got an SBI number, you can download your field parcel data directly onto this interactive map. And for a lot of our landowners, this is the first time that they've seen their farmland on an interactive map. And because we're partnering with Ordnance Survey, in the background you have all the Ordnance Survey maps, but also all the priority layers that you may want, whether it's public rights of way, uh, nitrate vulnerable zones, etc. And you can start looking at your land in the context of the landscape. And what we're doing there is trying to build up a baseline of what's there. So using that habitat system, or currently we're translating current agri-environment schemes into the UK habitat mapping classification, you can prioritise um, what's happening in your area. And it's just <coughs> worth noting, this land app section is the landowner's private data set. No one else can see what you're doing in there. You can do aspirational projects, you can create, you can amend, you can delete, you can do what you want. But what we're proposing is, similar to BPS, there's an annual submission where you submit what habitats are on the ground. So your baseline data, so it's your habitat and the management strategy attached to that on a yearly basis, so you just update it. And what that does is that pushes it into a database or a data hub. And at the moment we're working with Esri as our data hub. And this is where data is analysed. So from here, we can host that data at different levels of uh, visibility. So members of the public, and I will show you later if we have time, the public pages. So this is just statistical summaries of how many fields we've walked, the type of habitat you'll find in Gloucestershire. But if you're logged in as a farmer, you can also look at your farm maps. You can see what's happening over in neighbours' farms, the habitat, uh, connectivity, etc. But this also allows us to put some specialist data feeding in as well. Um, so basically, if you're a specialist, you get a grassland ecologist out to your farm. They can feed in data as well. So your, your data set is still under your control, but you're pushing into a wider data set. And that allows some spatial analysis at landscape scale. So when I say spatial analysis, I basically mean we can produce, for example, a heat map looking at all the pollen availability in Gloucestershire, like the Bee Lines project's doing, for example, and say, where is weaknesses? Where is there no pollen? And you can look at it for various attributes based on the UK HAB. Um, so, yeah, National Habitat Map. And uh, from Jenny's slides, remember, this allows you to identify opportunities for strategic and prioritised land management at a wider scale. But the great thing about this is it's cyclical. So this will hopefully feed back to the land app to update base layers, um, on the yearly submission, we get real-time data actually on the ground, um, but also it's influence and policy, so it's pushing back to DEFRA, and it keeps that cyclical cycle going round, with the farmers and the landowners at the forefront because they get to have a say in what's happening on their land, which I think within our trial is key. And that, that's it for now, but we can discuss it later, and hopefully I'll come onto the Elms Hub. Are you going to do the live bit later? Really yeah, I think so, but yeah. just for okay. time. Well, um, and that's brilliant, Dan, thank you. And just to finish off on the other layers, um, the bit that Dan was saying about the attribu I can't say the word, attribution of functionality, ecosystem service function, um, to each of those different UK HAB codes. We're really um, pleased because um, there's a, a project that's being run by the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology in Rossumstead called Agland which has got um, funding from the Treasury to attribute functionality of ecosystem services to different types of habitats. And they've said that what we're doing matches really well, so we're going to be given two postdoc uh, people to start to attribute that functionality of all those different ecosystem services, which will include food and fibre provision, which is really important for us from the farming community. We want to include food resilience. Um, it, as I say, it will be the, the provisioning services, that's the food fibre, um, the regulating services, that's water, air, carbon, um, and all of those, and the cultural services, that's our landscape heritage and all of that. So, um, and also the accountability, who are the people who designed the UK habitat mapping, are really kind, and they're working with us, and they're basically saying that they will allow us to, to um, sort of further develop them as ecologists as those attributes, but also, as, as Dan said, add the extra codes. Um, that we need. So we need we need management codes that will enable you to uh, to increase the functionality of that land. So we can create annual plans that will enable us to then have investment from the lots of different sources of funding that we're talking about. And what we're working on is how we can align this contribution from public, private, and third sector. So we've touched on a bit about what we're doing on the Elms, but what's really relevant about that as well is the fact that. You have all other different mechanisms coming on board as well. And as I say, Pascal's going to be talking about this, and I think this is a copy of your new map, Pascal, so I won't leave it on there that long. But we, the, the, basically, there's funding coming from planning mitigations and net gain, which we're talking about, 
and that's actually becoming um, quite um, uh, embedded within local authorities now about how they have a requirement to be able to to map their land. This is South Coast Council, I think, to have done this uh, this uh, this mapping. Um, and also there's other sort of like initiatives and I think what we're trying to do about trying to create the alignment is there seems to be a lot of noise around this. Uh, so for example the Environment Bank is now asking farmers for planning mitigations and things like that. So we want to contextualise and be able to work out what all these opportunities do within a line. Obviously we're already working with Thames Water and uh, the, with payments for ecosystem services. Um, there's also a huge market now growing for something called reverse auctions which is where groups of farmers working across catchments can start to collaborate and are uh, trying to solve problems for water companies like nitrate as well as pesticides. We can look at risk of individual field parcels, how their soil and water might be at risk. We can identify areas for, for natural flood management, uh, which is uh, aligned with our DEFRA pilot that we're doing. So all of these different areas have lots of different partners who have different ambitions and funding streams attached, um, and we're just trying to piece all of those together. Um, and yeah, this is the environment, uh, the, the, the trading, the end trading for pool holder and the reverse auctions we're already doing in Somerset. So all these mechanisms are actually coming on board. Um, carbon and carbon trading, this is happening already through things like the Woodland Code. And what we're really excited about is that we think that we can actually, uh, uh, Becky Wilson who's developed this um, with Adam Twine, who's one of our farmers, um, we think we can actually uh, collaborate the information that goes into uh, doing the calculations around carbon sequestration. So from the UK habitat mapping, so that we can look at productivity uh, information, and we can look at inputs on farms and um, businesses potentially um, to see if there's any issues around uh, emissions, but more importantly for farmland and our natural environment, we can actually work out and attribute sequestration function to different habitat types and management types. Um, and then what's also coming on board, which hopefully will be enabling, is for us to understand the, um, the green finance uh, that is coming on board to help uh, invest in the transformation. And what we want to know is a lot of the big banks and people are saying we want a green investment, well let's give them some projects they can invest in. And actually there is a role for agri-tech in around helping us to become more efficient and aware of how we can do some of these things. So. Um, it's quite interesting because, as I say, we're trying to align with all the other different uh, tests and trials. Patrick Holden and various people are talking about the whole uh, range of sustainability uh, that we can link in and benchmarking. So I think at the moment, our next, uh, our next uh, thing to do really is to try and finish our phase one, which finishes in March, where we're hoping that by the time that we've mapped the 20 farms and the, the, and the parishes uh, around, the parishes are kind enough to help us, which they are Fairford, Sarah, Sester, and Davisford, Lowestwell, and Garter Power are all our five communities. Um, that we will have a, a, a very um, robust way to show DEFRA that we think we've got a platform from which uh, everybody seems to concur, seems to be a good way to work, and that um, that in the next year we're able to share that across um, across different networks. Um, what we want to do is to make sure that the government has been told that. Um, it has to be simple forward-facing, and I think it does have to be simple forward-facing. We don't need this to be a complex system for farmers and communities to understand. What they need, though, is to benefit from all this different alignment of opportunity. We want urgently for the government to have environmental advisors that are going out to each community to be able to let people realise these opportunities and to make sure that the right opportunity is put in the right place. Um, and so uh, that is why we want to do the, uh, the uh, sort of independent uh, assessment that we're doing on the cost benefit of specialist advisors. We've got £15,000 from the Roddick Foundation, which CCRI are also doing for us, which is about trying to demonstrate <coughs> independently the value of advisors in aligning all of this. And so that simply sort of runs through again with you, the opportunities that we know are there, we know we've got all this funding, and we know that we can actually um, uh, maximise the opportunities for this uh, environmental recovery and resilience planning, but we just need to be helped sometimes to be able to work our way through what are the best opportunities for us as communities to do that. Um, and we hope that this is a platform the government will think is interesting to be involved with. So that's just the role well, of facilitators call that sort of thing. So just my last slides really is to say that what we think that, that we want to create a structure for the government to see how this might be done. <coughs> We think it's important to work through catchment partnerships like ours um, and that those should align with the ambition at a county level um, of the local enterprise partnership and the local nature partnerships. 
In Gloucestershire, we've got one of the greenest, um, apparently, industrial strategies, correct me if I'm wrong, um, partly because of the endeavours of people like Roger Morton and the World Life Trust and Chris and the LNP and Jackie Jobs, who have fiercely fought for environmental protection in Gloucestershire for us. And that, so the catchment partnerships can feed up to the LNP, we can align all this data, we can analyse this data, we can look at the gaps, and we can collaboratively enable each um, community to take action and have an understanding of how we can use the data to make those societal choices that I talked about. And that we can use our local enterprise partnerships to enable investment to take place, to absorb human pressures and enable us to be economically um, sort of healthy and, and sustainable, but we've got the data of how we can do that in a sympathetic way with all the necessary mitigations that we, that we need to take. Um, and, yeah, and so at the end of the day, one of the things that I haven't got time to show you, but the, there's, there's, a, there's an international initiative called Terraton, which is all about soil. And um, if, we, if we take the whole of the global soil um, organic matter up by one degree, we can sequestrate three trillion tonnes of carbon, and then that will solve our problem. So if we all go out <coughs> and make our soil better, then we'll be able to do that. And if we manage our water, we can manage our soil, and we can all become much more resilient. And also, I was just going to say, Please don't forget the food in this because we can ask our farmers to deliver all these public goods, but we all still need to be um, able to eat uh, sustainable and healthy produced food. So um, that's a sort of quick run through about Elm Tribe.